Strontium aluminate is a photoluminescent phosphor with a remarkably long persistence of phosphorescence. It's used for pretty much anything you'd like to see glow in the dark. Things like glow sticks, wash dials, and even this glowing bike path in Poland. Strontium aluminate is a second generation luminous compound and replaced the first generation zinc sulfide. Zinc sulfide doesn't glow nearly as long or intensely and it tends to wear out a lot faster than strontium aluminate. I've actually tried to make zinc sulfide a couple times as well, but the chemical is incredibly sensitive to iron impurities, which is a really tough thing for me to eliminate entirely in my lab. Anyway, making strontium aluminate is, in theory, pretty easy to do. Ideally, you could just fuse the oxides of strontium and aluminum together at high heat, and voila! In reality though, this took four attempts to produce a working final product, and so today I'll be showing the method that actually works, and commenting why I think the others didn't. Now for each of my attempts, I began by dissolving aluminum in hydrochloric acid to form the soluble salt aluminum trichloride. This particular reaction tends to be incredibly aggressive, and so it's best to use an excessively large beaker to prevent it from boiling over. Once the aluminum was completely dissolved, it was next diluted with a large excess of water and slowly neutralized under constant stirring using 2 molar sodium hydroxide. This is a simple displacement reaction that results in the formation of soluble sodium chloride and insoluble aluminum hydroxide. It is important in this step though to only continue adding the sodium hydroxide until the pH is between 7 and 8, and this is because once the pH increases past 9, the aluminum will begin to redissolve as sodium aluminate. As a side note, a super easy source of soluble aluminum is alum, which is available at most grocery stores near the spices. Anyway, once all the aluminum hydroxide had precipitated, it was next collected by vacuum filtration. This process is pretty annoying due to the gelatinous consistency of aluminum hydroxide, but with enough patience, I was left with a thick slab of still very wet aluminum hydroxide. This was next scooped into a dish and dried under vacuum desiccation for a few days. After it was completely dry, the aluminum hydroxide was powdered and 7.8 grams were weighed out. I then weighed out 7.38 grams of strontium carbonate, as well as 0.1 grams of dysprosium oxide and another 0.1 grams of europium hydroxide. These were all transferred to a new beaker along with some water, and to this I added nitric acid under constant stirring until no more bubbling occurred. Now while this is happening, I'm going to slow down for a second and explain what all is going on. One thing I didn't mention earlier in the video is that strontium aluminate does not glow on its own, and zinc sulfide doesn't glow all that well alone either. To obtain a long-lasting glow, or to modulate the color of light produced, both zinc sulfide and strontium aluminate are typically doped with tiny amounts of specific metal oxides. In the case of zinc sulfide, copper can be used to obtain the classic green glow, while silver will produce a blue and manganese will produce an orange. In the case of strontium aluminate, however, most of the suitable doping agents are rare earth metals. I've read about cerium, praseodymium, neodymium, manganese, europium, and dysprosium all being used, but from what I could tell, the europium-dysprosium pairing was the most common. This brings me to my first failed attempt at this project, where I made the mistake of using trivalent europium oxide. Trivalent europium oxide produces virtually no photoluminescence whatsoever, and it's critical to use the divalent hydroxide instead. I didn't think this would be a problem at first, thinking the europium would be oxidized to the trivalent state under the extreme reaction conditions anyway, but apparently this is not the case. Anyway, once the mixture stopped bubbling, I continued to add nitric acid until the pH was around 3. I then heated the mixture under constant stirring for a few hours to drive off all the excess water and continue reacting the elements to their respective nitrates. Once stirring eventually became difficult, I took the beaker off the heat, allowed it to cool, and then transferred the fused salt mass to a porcelain crucible. This was then placed in my toaster oven and heated at 200 degrees celsius for a few hours to drive off as much water as possible. This was then transferred directly into my microwave kiln and fired for exactly 30 minutes at 1200 watts. The idea here is that the extreme heat produced by the microwave kiln should decompose each of these metal nitrates to their respective oxides, which will then fuse together to form the target product. At this point I'll go ahead and try to explain my other two failures. For my second failure, I basically tried to simply grind together the four reagents in their powder form and fire them directly for 15 minutes. 
This resulted in a product that had very faint luminescence and was only luminescent at all in certain spots. The light it produced was also more yellow rather than the desired green, and didn't really sustain at all once the light source was removed. I figured that the non-uniform luminescence was a result of the doping agents not really being able to effectively combine with the strontium aluminate from simply grinding the four together. This led me to eventually find a patent which described the production of strontium aluminate by the decomposition of nitrate salts, which is the method I show in the video. My third and final failure was essentially doing everything exactly as I've shown, but firing the salt mass for the previously mentioned 15 minutes rather than the 30 minutes I used for my successful run. This third batch produced the same faint yellow glow as the second, only completely uniform this time, which I figured was at least something of an improvement. At first, I thought this was a problem with the new method, figuring that nitrate would almost certainly oxidize europium to its trivalent state, especially at such high temperatures. However, since the yellow color was unchanged from the second run conducted without the presence of any oxidizing agent, I figured it was more likely a problem with the reaction temperature. Given that I did all of this in a microwave kiln, I didn't really have any way to monitor the reaction temperature, and given that I thought the target chemical was a simple mixed oxide, I didn't really think I had to. As it turns out, however, my specific target strontium aluminate cannot simply be made by heating the nitrates to their decomposition temperature. Simply doing it this way as I had been results in the formation of inconsistent strontium aluminates with a variety of empirical formulas. These will still glow to varying degrees and intensities, but to produce the 1 to 2 desired ratio of strontium and aluminum, the mixture must be heated to at least 1250 to 1500 degrees Celsius, which my poor kiln was clearly not able to reach in a mere 15 minutes. To fix this, I tried doubling the time to 30 minutes, which is how I finally produced a satisfactory final product. The raw strontium aluminate came out of the kiln as a rock-solid, off-white, almost yellowish mass that was more difficult to powder using my mortar than any chemical I've ever made. In the course of my research, I did come across a method to make the final mass easier to powder by the addition of urea as a swelling agent prior to the final firing, but I wanted to remove any unnecessary variables from this process, given I was already having such a hard time with it. Eventually, I did finally powder it down to the point that I felt it was as good as it was going to get, and then I dumped the resulting powder into a weigh boat. I went ahead and then cut the lights and was delighted to see my powder glow. To be completely honest, I did check to see if this worked long before I went through the effort of powdering it, which it obviously did. The difference, though, is that the light was much more dim and nearly impossible to see on camera. This leads me to believe that there are some impurities here that accumulated on the surface, and could likely be further washed and cleaned for an even cleaner glow. I decided not to bother with this out of a fear I'd ruin something I spent so long making, but I figured I'd point it out. Anyway, as I pointed out at the start of the video, europium dysprosium doped strontium aluminate is a photoluminescent phosphor with a remarkably long persistence of phosphorescence. This basically means that it glows when exposed to light, and continues glowing even once the light is taken away. This is most often done using light in the visible spectrum, but actually works better using UV light due to the higher energy of UV radiation. Now the way this works is that phosphorescent materials such as zinc sulfide or strontium aluminate produce light in a similar way as fluorescent materials. The difference between these two types of luminescence is the ability of phosphorescent materials to continue to glow after the excitation energy source is removed. In both cases, luminescence and phosphorescence occur when an electron absorbs a photon and becomes excited from the ground state to a higher energy level. This electron then relaxes back down to the ground state along with the re-emission of a new photon with slightly lower energy and therefore a longer wavelength than the incident photon. In the case of luminescence, this excitation and relaxation occurs only between the ground state and one specific excited state. In the case of phosphorescent materials, however, this electron is excited to higher energy levels and therefore needs to make the relaxation back down to the ground state incrementally. As a result, phosphorescent materials can continue glowing long after their electrons are no longer being energized. As a quick side note, the energy needed to excite these electrons does not have to come from photons, and often comes from chemical energy, which is how glow sticks work. 
From the 1910s through the 1970s, one popular source of this energy was the radioactive decay of radium. Radium salts could be mixed with zinc sulfide and applied as a paint, specifically to watch dials. Since radium has a half-life of 1,600 years, this paint could continuously glow for decades and only really faded when zinc sulfide itself finally degraded. As incredible as this was, applying this paint was a major workplace hazard that resulted in several horrific casualties. Other people on YouTube have certainly covered this topic in better detail than I've got time for, and if you haven't heard of this and have an interest in history, I'd definitely look into it. Anyway, at this point I'm just sort of rambling, so I'll go ahead and close here. I hope you found this video interesting, and as always, I want to thank all my incredible patrons for their generous contributions. Your support is vital and very appreciated. To everyone else, if you'd like to see more content like this, consider subscribing on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, or even by becoming a patron yourself. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.